goes into a borehole, goes right down into where where we're where we're looking, and it locks itself in place and it fires this what's called a phased array. I mean very recently been able to extend that over 100 meters, so 350 feet. We couldn't move the tool. So what we did was we went straight down below the formation and then were able to aim the sound back up. Good morning and welcome to episode six of Crownsman Energy. On this episode, we are joined by Tim Davies. He is the CEO and founder of Turkana, and he is here to discuss how the company has developed its technology, funding streams, and collaboration with major oil and gas companies. But before we get started, let's thank our sponsors. We are sponsored by Savina Equipment. Are you working on pipelines, oil and gas projects, renewable energy or LNG, and need to save some cash? Savina Equipment has industrial pumps, electrical equipment from motors to transformers, and even surplus pipe and much, much more available now. Visit SavinaEquipment.com to view all their available inventory. Again, SavinaEquipment.com, where you will find more equipment every day. We're also sponsored by PowerZone Equipment. When you need a specialized team of world-class engineers for your oil and gas pipelines, dewatering, or any fluid handling needs, you want to visit PowerZone.com. In addition to their inventory of rebuilt pumps, motors, engines, they also have an amazing team to design and engineer your systems no matter the challenge, no matter the location. Get in the zone with PowerZone. Visit them at PowerZone.com. Now, please enjoy Episode 6 of Crownsman Energy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Crownsman Energy. I am your host, Jared Downey. And with me today is the CEO of Turkana, Tim Davies. Tim, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks a lot, Jared. How are you? Good, good. I'm excited to have you on the show. It's an interesting technology that you're doing. Um, it's, it's something that a lot of viewers won't be uh, aware of that's available. And, and for those uh, that are, um, they'll, they'll gain a new understanding of the technology you're using. I have to start off the show by saying you have one of my favorite slogans, making the earth transparent. It just hits you right between the eyes. So can you talk a little bit about what, what that slogan, why you have it and what it means for the company? Sure. Many years ago, we, we, I, I was involved in, in a seismic exploration company and, and the oil and gas sector directly. And what we always joked about was, well, wouldn't it be great if we could just aim some magic wand around and have it point out where the resources are, where the water is, or where the, the fracture network that makes the thing all flow, where it all was. So it, it, it was like a, a thing that I wanted to do for a long time. but couldn't, wasn't technically possible because we, we, we had to put a computer, a supercomputer in a five inch borehole. You had to have it cool because as you know, computers when they get hot don't work very well. And when we're looking through the earth, we have to go down into the ground and look through uh, with a huge uh, imaging system. That is a very big version of what everybody knows. And that's a medical ultrasound. This is just the world's biggest ultrasound. It's in a tube down in the earth and it can aim anywhere you want in real time and see what's there. And that has never been done. So that, that was a, a thing we wanted to do. Um, we were very pleased to be able to do it. We got a lot of industrial sponsorship from major uh, clients, et cetera, for that. And uh, you know, we've done it. So where, where we're really at today is we've just come off completing the uh, proof of uh, uh, sort of commerciality trials with a couple of the major Canadian names and one of the larger U.S. names. And we've been uh, now got invites to try the technology out with people like Aramco, Chevron, ExxonMobil, uh, Chesapeake, Husky, CNRL, Sonovas, blah, 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 on and on and on. The list of the names of people that, that will be working with the tech will be, be sort of the A-team of what's going on. The weird thing is, of course, the oil industry really is, it, it's kind of not doing very well right now, as, as we know, but there are golden opportunities within that sector, and, and we happen to be in the best one, and that's in the carbon sequestering business, the, the enhanced oil business. We, through the use of our technology, really are able to cut the amount of materials used in the conventional sort of fracking world, that, that bad word that we keep hearing about we're able to cut the materials down by half and the amount of water used by half 
it, you know, it's just a, it's an amazing technology that once you can make the earth transparent, you will be able to do things that you could not do before. And that, that's pretty much why we went into this. Let's, let's actually start. There's a video that I saw on your, your website that breaks it down. Um, and that, that's on a fracking, that's on a fracking line, um, showing, showing the technology. Can you just walk through and I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up on the screen here for the audience. Um, can you just walk us through what we're seeing in that video just to get the audience gets a visual understanding of what you're doing? Yeah. I mean, the, what we've, what we've managed to do essentially is looking at uh, imaging the earth as uh, just a normal problem, like as if it was metal or like it was a person or something like that. And so we built this system that uh, goes into a borehole, goes right down into where, where, we're, where we're looking, and it locks itself in place and it fires this what's called a phased array. Um, that means it can fire sound anywhere. And what we do is we lock in the borehole and we rotate the tool to any angle we want. And, and, it, and the, the big deal is it's repeatable. And we, so we can know where we are, how deep we are, where we're aiming. And as a result of knowing where we're aiming, we know where everything in that picture is in terms of its relationship to the real world. So we can do X, Y, and Z from the borehole. So the three dimensions uh, plus the, the azimuth, we can aim at the target. So what we're able to do is say, well, you have a fracture. Uh, 125 meters out that way, its range and bearing is such and such. Or, you know, if this were the old mining days, you'd be looking for a, a vein of something that disappeared. You'd find it, oh, there it is. It's 85 meters this way and sloping like this. Same thing in the, the oil and gas sector. And even more so now, even in the carbon sequestering sector. So where we can map and see these fractures, yeah, it, it, it just changes that game. It allows us to capture carbon and put it into a fracture network that's not going to break out. It's not going to go pollute, um, you know, aquifers and things like that. Now we'll be able to put a technology in the ground that verifies where the water, where the oil, where the carbon, where it's all flowing in real time and totally de-risk the whole operation. You, you mentioned that back, uh, that it was a, the idea of waving a magic wand around and then it w was always something that everybody wanted of course but how did you get to the point where where you actually were able to start developing the pro the project like, did it start in the energy sector is that where you were thinking that you would use this technology i i, I guess it's almost i got to jump back a ways cuz um i originally you know long time ago was, was in the, the, the subsea imaging business, the defense imaging business. And, um, you know, we worked with sonar systems and radar systems and all kinds of imaging. And, and so we decided that we would, would make a medical imaging system and, and that worked out very well. That really worked out well. Problem is it took 20 minutes, so it was no good. It was a great picture, but ultrasound's real time. We couldn't compute it fast enough. So we, mm -hmm. we you know, we went to seismic and we did that and that ended up in an oil company and we sold that. But I went right back to medicine because that's why I always wanted to work in medicine. And, and we started a couple of companies that to do with, with the imaging and which we then successfully exited and went back into the oil and gas and thought, well, let's do the same thing there. And it wasn't possible at the time to put a computer down and all. It just wasn't, wasn't doable. So, we were, became involved in another medical project, which won a lot of awards for actually, and it was we had a successful exit, um, and, and that was uh, Innovision Medical, and that was that was went really well. And so when we exited that, it was said, okay, now I can get build this computer, I can put it in this tube, and we can make this product. So I went to a number of companies and and you know described what I was going to be doing, and they they were very helpful in terms of saying, you know, firstly, oh you're crazy, it can't be done, but then if it could be done, this is what we'd like it to do. So mm. we then got a number of sponsors together that were end users and, and they were large, well-funded companies. And we started to, they, they agreed to fund the company and build the project. So we, we did, and we, we got completed uh, late last year, uh, I mean, late 2018. And in 2019 spent all in the field uh, testing completed around Christmas. Obviously, we're ready to go out again now, but we're not. The the pandemic <laughs> kind of ended that for now. But it, it's uh, 
So it, it came from the medical world where we could see everything in real time and we just wanted to know what if we did the same thing in, in the rocks? What would it do? And, and lo and behold, you know, it, it shows flow paths. And, and that we didn't really expect. It was an unexpected outcome. We hoped we would see things like that, but we, we, we have. And the system itself, if, if, there's a, if we look at the presentation, you know, the, uh, the energy presentation around slide three, we, we see the system there, the 75 foot long phased array uh, system. And it, 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 it's got all this fiber optics in it. It's got seven, five computers, sorry, uh, two GPU computers. It's got an AI engine. It run, it's a really complicated system. But we mm. built it on it works. And now we're here uh, where we're going to expand the company. And we've been requested by, uh, for example, the U.S. Department of Energy and the University of Texas A&M requested us to join us in the frack lab because all the major companies are all interested in cutting uh, carbon emissions, cutting uh, pollution, doing all of these things. And they have the really monster budgets now to not emit, not pollute. Uh, while, while they've always tried not to, now it, it is a mandatory thing where people want to look at carbon sequestering instead of just uh, dumping, venting to atmosphere. They, they're, they're really moving forward very, very quickly and doing everything humanly possible. And of course, when we saw these fractures, it, it also opened up the water business because the water disposal people and the water mm. extraction people had no way of knowing what was going on out there. So now we do. So now we're going to also be testing... Uh, water contamination and water preservation and water storage so that we can make sure we can certify that there is no flow out of that reservoir. And, and that's really been a, been a key thing for a lot of people, you know, oh, you're going to pollute. Well, are we? Now we can audit that. We can actually say, look, here's the fracture network and it does not connect to this other fracture network or things like that, that, that are just critical to know. And now it does really, it de-risks also all other carbon sequestering projects. They've got nothing to do with oil and gas. You know, the environmental monitoring sector is huge now. It was right. not yeah. big a few years ago. Now it's a whole industry and we had no tools, no real tools that could go down deep and see what was going on, except measuring right at the borehole. We've changed all that. We, we're now out hundreds of feet from the borehole. The, the, a question that, that comes up to me when you're talking about um, I mean, like you said, I mean, Ted, 10, 20 years ago, the technology wouldn't have been possible just because the, the, the computers themselves wouldn't have even been developed to process. Where do you have a vision? Uh, I've noticed that it goes, you know, the imaging goes uh, 50 meters, 165 feet into the reservoir. Is that right? Well, that's, so, that's right. But, you know, now... Um, we have been able to just, I mean, very recently, been able to extend that over 100 meters, so 350 feet out into the borehole. So, yeah, that's, it's, it's a long way. And that it is. And then where, where does the technology, like you, you, you already said, it's already expanding into, into, other, into other fields. Um, you know, environmental da data collection is going to be a big thing. Where do you see sort of where it's going to go? And I want to go back into, you know, you've got some slides. I want to get into, you know, give the audience a little more visual again. But just as a general uh, viewpoint, where where does it expand out from here as the technology keeps getting better and better? Well, if, if we're looking at, at, at slide 17 on the uh, uh, presentation, um, you'll see a picture that shows what we see when we've done the, the, the process. We, we see these lines going through there. We see changes in this, this 3D. That means changes in the rocks. The lines are fractures, they're liniments. So when we look at this, what's happened now is that when we presented this final report, uh, obviously hundreds of pages, a lot more detail than this, to the clients, what happened was uh, the 35 people in the room were, were getting up and say, well, look, I see this in this picture, I see that. We can do this with it and that with it, whether it would be enhanced oil recovery, water disposal, looking for tunnels, mining for minerals on Mars, um, doing deep ocean mining. This system has proven that now we can go to any solid object and look through it. We don't need even to be there because we can run this autonomously because we're, we've created an AI system that will manage it. We've created an AI system that will understand what it's seeing autonomously. So there's a, there's a lot of 
potential uses. Obviously, the oil and gas was number one because at the time of developing it, there was a, a massive push for uh, you know, the beginning of the environmental side and cost reduction. So it, it, uh, it starts there. But the, the obvious thing, the pull is water monitoring, water resource, carbon capture, and ultimately minerals and other uses that, well, you know, subsea mining, but you know, off earth imaging, they will have to have a system and this will do it. It's just too damn heavy to lift right now, but that's a materials problem, not a technology problem. I see. I want to get into a little bit more of the technology. You know, you've already sort of touched on it through and it, you know, if there's any slides that will help be helpful. Um, there's, you have long range and short range imaging. Can you sort of break those down, um, what the difference between those two are, ob obviously, other than in the names, but is, is, is it a different technology or is it just a different setup? Yeah, we, we, uh, we really came across kind of a weird problem. When we were going around and we were talking with um, exploration teams from, from major companies, and we'd have six, seven people in the room or 10 or 12 people in the room, Everyone was very excited, you know, that, oh, yeah, this is too good to be true, and it's, it's great, and, you know, so, and, and you know, normal reactions, it's all good. But half the room didn't care about seeing 100 meters, didn't care about 50 meters. Half of the room concerned only with the borehole and very close to it, like what damage was done around, are there cracks or the leaks or the, you know, all of this other stuff that we didn't deal with. But over half the people in the room said, I wish you had a short range tool. And, you know, it, it got me thinking that, well, yeah, I, I know that the big money is in the long range imaging, but I had no idea that the short range imaging in that sector was so bad that really all I could see was the well bore from the inside of the well bore and map this tube, and hopefully find things. But they didn't show behind, they didn't show the cement, they didn't show the rock, they didn't show anything to do with that structure of that, that borehole except cartoon pictures. So I thought, well, I can't make a picture the same way I use the, the, the big tool. That It's a different technology, but I think I can do this. So I, I went in the lab and we, we built a system up and got uh, a couple of the major companies to supply parts, and we, we imaged them, and it worked. We could see the best part of the foot. We saw cement. We saw steel. We saw through it. We saw holes into the rock. It was, it, it worked really well. So what we decided to do was take the infrastructure off the main Turkana tool. So we, we could develop a different tool to put on the bottom of this, this uh, imaging system. And it would be the short range system. Um, so we've created a, an, another department, another group to, to do that called Innovision Wellbore. And it will be focused strictly on the, uh, the, the, the short range and, and, you know, probably we'll make a, a focus video on that on just that one um, in in the near term. Um, it's a probably eight to ten months from commercial deployment, whereas the long range tool is in the field now, beginning to right. do long term testing. So different stages of development, but we have a good product line coming. You know what I mean? So, but I was surprised. Literally, everybody you know was lift. Nobody wanted to see ten meters. Everyone wants to see fifty meters or under one. There was just two big groups. So. Right. That's interesting. The the I I mean what it comes down to is gathering data and I mean there's uh, that's I I don't think we even do a show anymore without uh the coming out coming up the need to gather data the quicker the data you get the data the you know if it's in real time you can make decisions on the fly you know all these things. Yeah. Can you talk about the data collection side? Because I, I know it's a, I mean, it's a key part to what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, the, the data is, is, takes a number of forms, but it is a lot of data. Um, each time we take a picture, the array fires 32 transmitters and receivers, which are then, the, 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 re the reflections are recorded by receivers, 32 of them on the system. And we send all that data up the, up the tool by fiber optic lines to the surface, at which point that is then converted into an image and the data that made the image. So those are two separate things because what we see as a picture is just that, it's just a picture. You know, it's, it's a representation of the data we got. The data itself is a, got a lot more in it than just the picture. So we analyze the data. Right. I think the AI system actually goes back to a patent I had in the, the late 80s where, 
uh, where we uh, got some company. Yeah, we were able to differentiate tissues. So I had some patent colleague, the, the, the uh, attribute analysis, the, you know, the how to differentiate tissues, because we come up with a way of saying that this is a tumor, this is not a tumor. So I've taken that same idea and applied it here to the imager. And we have on, uh, you'll see on slides 24, 25, 26, on that presentation, what we call attribute analysis. And what it's doing is showing differences in geology and it tells us that one thing is different than another without having to see the picture. And it does that by doing this massive, you know, physics analysis and doing the statistics of each of the pixels. And then it does, uh, like in, in slide 26, you're gonna see cross plots. So what we'll see is these colors that are red or green and are they separable? Can we see that these are separate? And if that's true, then the machine can make the decision on what, what, what's what. What are the differences in geology you know, we, we go up and, and we can see in, in many of these pictures different areas in the picture, and it will tell us this is where the carbon sequester front is, this is where the water is, this is oil, this, you know, all of these things that can be done through artificial intelligence that we've proven successful, used it before in humans, and now we've validated it on the rocks because we, we also, you know, we, 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 we managed to image some things that were known to them or they suspected. So that, that was a, a really good thing. You know, we, AI is, is uh, for us not only a, a, a labor saving device because it, it, it takes the professional and lets them look at really high candidate target pictures. It, it just, it allows us now to do so much more with the tool without having to have nine people. It, 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 it cuts out four or five people and it increases the time to real time. Right. And I want to get into a little bit about what, I mean, you've, you've been in the field, especially with the long range. Uh, can you give an example? I, I always like on the show, we can actually give a, a, you know, a real, real world example. So do you have you know, an, a, a project that you've been working on or, or um, have worked on that, that, that successfully executed? Yeah, we, we, we do. And, and what, we, what we have, um, if we look at... Uh, to put into uh, picture 18, um, you know, the, the 17, 18, 19 in that presentation you see. Um, th this came from the, the most recent successful project we've had. And what we were trying to do was uh, trying to image where fluid paths go through the rock. And it was an experiment, right? Because no one's done this, so we didn't, we didn't know how it would work out. So if we can see in, in slide 17 on that thing, that you can see these lines coming straight at this borehole and those are what they call wormholes. Those are fluid conduit paths created through the sand by the production of water and oil. And that, those are the flow paths right to the borehole. We see also in there these, these straight lines in different places in the picture. Those are fracture systems. And when we look at that and we, we, we put on top of there the, the map of what's called the stress map, it, our picture lines up perfectly with the local stress pattern. So we know which way things will flow. Because on fractures, not everything flows. Everything can open up and it will flow fantastic one way. If, if it's pressed and closed, it won't flow at all through it. So knowing the fractures defines the plumbing system of the formation, whether that be for carbon, water, oil, gas, doesn't matter what you're looking for, that's how it got there, was through fractures. It does not flow through solid rock. Fractures are the plumbing. Yo, you would obviously have a good understanding of all this going in when you started to develop it. But have there was there any projects stood out to you that once you started into it, there was a new set of challenges or a, a whole new set of things that you realized coming that you just didn't know coming in, and obviously helped develop the technology more efficiently. Yeah, no, that, we did, and and, and um, we had one situation where we went in the borehole and it was uh, on the Saskatchewan Alberta border and we were trying to move the, the tool around, but it, it was locked, it wouldn't move. And you know, a million dollar tool and all that made me very nervous. And it, so we, we tried to move it, it wouldn't move. So um, what we thought was that the holes they blow through the steel casing were eroded or broken. Mm -hmm. We couldn't move the tool. So what we did was we went straight down below the formation and then we're able to aim the sound back up through the formation. So we were able to bypass where the damage in the wellbore was 
and image the thing from a different angle. So we did not get the data directly out through the, uh, the perforations in the, the well bore. We had to go to another area and look back. And we were able, to, we, we did get three quarters of the formation. The uh, reason we didn't get, of course, all of it is because we're shooting up like this. And the formation is, is through here like that. We should have been shooting like that, but we couldn't, we couldn't turn. So it was, uh, that was the only bad one we've had so far. We, we, we've done about nine jobs. And that was the only one that was, was presented issues so far. We don't actually know how good the first number of jobs are other than of course everybody wants to do more of them so that that's an indication that they're getting a lot of of good stuff so 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 far we haven't been defeated we have got the maps uh done properly even the first ones work so uh, what we have shown is where it's bad we've been able to get around it haven't lost tool yet so that that's the important <laughs> <laughs> That's sort of key. You know, when you talked, you talked a little bit about going over to the medical field. Uh, you won an award over there. I want to unpack this a bit because, I mean, what you've developed in is all, it, it's sort of, uh, it, it's coming from all this experience, the education you've had, the research you've done. Can you take us back? Where, where did you start out your career? So, um, I graduated from the University of Calgary and um I think it was 1975, 76 to 78. Um, and I was, uh, I started working for Lockheed and a subsidiary of Lockheed called Can Ocean Engineering. And we did, uh, you know, subsea work. And that gave me really a, a really great grounding globally in, in imaging systems and very, very high tech and all off the charts advanced. And I then decided, well, you know, if, if I'm actually got this system that admittedly is horrifically expensive, but it can take a picture that is so high resolution that in the 70s it wasn't, it was just would have been magic. And then I could put it in a machine, then I, I could actually, you know, figure out what was the tumor and what wasn't. I could do a medical system. And, you know, that was in 1988, I think. It worked, it worked really well, except it was too slow. Uh, the picture was nearly MRI quality, but it was too slow. So at that, you know, at that point, I'd, I'd say, well, what, what, who wants a fantastic picture that doesn't mind waiting 20 minutes? Well, the oil and gas industry, because they wait wait sometimes months for their seismic processing. So and their logs in the wells take weeks to come back, and you know all the data get analyzed. So it, I decided to try that, and and it worked. I had a number of friends that were senior positions in oil companies and had their own and we, we tried it out and lo and behold ended up with a joint venture with the u.s major um doing exclusive work for them and that went very well it was great too because you know some of the time their properties would not be economic so instead of paying us money they would give us a property which was great it worked oh. out so we ended up uh, enhancing our own fields and then sold the company very successful exit and that's when I decided, you know, I can do the medical system in real time, which I did. Mm. And we won the Alberta uh, Science Prize, uh, you know, for, for medical imaging. Um, then as we've, we've done that, we sold that um, and now said, okay, now I can do this downhole. I, I'll go and do a, make this tool. We made the tool as you, you know, you'll, you'll show your, your viewers and the pictures and things like that. that we made it, and uh, we came top ten in the Rice University uh, Clean Tech Award. We were sponsored to uh, a number of these uh, things, like by companies. Well, Saudi Aramco sponsored us. Uh, Repsol Energy from Spain sponsored us too for a different talk. And so, we're getting early phase industry traction as much as you can in this day and age with oil at next to no money and the pandemic happening. We're going pretty quick considering. So there's a lot of great response to that, but it, it did take sort of 40 years to get here. Um, it's been an enjoyable ride, but you know, this is now uh, one of those, those projects that uh, was so expensive to do that you want to stay with it and take it to the, as far as you can, you know, and uh, so far we, we've, we've spent, you know, approximately 10, $12 million building this tool and running it this list wow. for a while. And we've, we've been fortunate to have a lot of non-dilutive financing from the, the governments and we will be getting a lot of 
more of non-dilutive financing from the government to continue the testing and development, et cetera, and paid trials with customers, of course. So. You know, it's one of the things that what you've you've brought up um, that you've been you've been sponsored, then you've had funding. You it's forty years in the making. Um, it's. I actually just had a conversation uh, yesterday with a friend of mine, um, and we were talking about. There was a lot of emphasis on um, if you go if you watch let's say leadership videos on YouTube. There's a lot of emphasis on dealing with people. Um, uh, you know, uh, essentially having a good attitude, and uh, you know, the, these types of, it sort of revolves built around those things, sort of believing in those things, which is, there's all, there's all truth to that. But how much of what you have developed is, is developing through a skill set? Because it's very technical what you do. And you've really put, you've really developed a product by putting in value. Sort of, what do you think the percentage, not, not percentage, What's been the key in, in in this project particular? Is it your ability to communicate and deal with people in the industry, develop these sponsorship and partnerships? Um, or is it that technical savvy that you have to actually develop a project that pro, product that creates a demand? I, I'm just curious for someone who's you know developing um, in, well in any industry, but specifically in the energy sector, sort of what that key element is um, for in your case. The, the two things you, you, you brought up was the, the technical side, right? And, and that's very strong, but the interpersonal skills, the, the team. So it, it, it is both, right? I mean, yes, I, you know, have high skill in physics and imaging and those things. And the rest of the team does. It is technically extremely difficult and you would not do it unless you really knew what you were doing, which we do. However, the ability, I think, of the team, and, and it's all about high-performance teams, right? I mean, we, we, we do like to be able to get to a point where any individual in a team is no longer critical. And that's, that's not true in those early days, you know? So we've been building up this incredible team. And, and now we, we, we have that, where we have you know, expert physicists, expert imaging, data transfer people. I mean, the, the whole team is really good. Yes, uh, I initiated the AI and the actual imaging itself, but now the team is fully capable now of, of implementing and moving those things forward. But what we found was that listening to, to customers or what people that might be customers, when you sit down at the beginning of the project and say, look, this is what I want to do. And yes, it sounds a little crazy, but what, what would you do with it if it worked? And so, you know, a lot of those conversations mm. were really, I won't say like intimate conversations, but they weren't customer client type things. They were communication on a more personal level. So we were able to develop criteria for success of the project. We were, and people, uh, I got a, I guess I, I, I got a, a free pass on can they even do this? Because I had done prior and complex, very expensive mm. and delivered them. So there was a, a bit of faith there that, you know, they, they'd cash in a bit of goodwill. And fortunately, of course, it, it's worked out very well. So uh, although it was a gamble on their parts, because and a big one, because, you know, the, the great names of this, this business, the Slumberjay, Halliburton, uh, Baker Hughes, etc., they have not been able to achieve this yet. Um, they've been working for a long time, and I'm no doubt they will achieve it. And hopefully, with our success, well, not hopefully, I hope they never learn to do it. But it, the fact is, they, <laughs> they're fantastic companies with unlimited budgets, essentially, relative to us. So, um, and then we, we know they're really close watching us. They, they actually are now inviting us into things and talking to us. And, Maybe one day one of those will be a nice exit for us. That's that's the plan anyway. Is to uh, that's the hope, yeah. Well, you need, you know, it, it, we can think. Well, we're going to raise three or four million dollars now and get another eight or ten in matching government money, non diluted. But then we go and say, okay, well, what if we then go global? How does that much? Well, that's an, a twenty, thirty million dollar raise. Yeah, and that's then easier to say to guys like Shell and BP and SO and all these guys. A Norwegian government, they're a big player in this thing too. So right. we, we would just say to them, you know, we, we're, we're going to go do this. And when we're done, you will be a, a customer. And, and they have been. 
and they are there. All these companies, when we they just said, well, it worked. Lo and behold, it worked. And so what do we do now? Well, we plan, but we can't because there's no budgets. So here we are today trying to move forward. And it, you know, it's a very difficult time for everybody, but we are still finding the sponsorship in the industry to keep moving forward as we're aiming more towards their environmental issues and solving those issues. So we're very, very happy with the clients, but it's only come from communication, really. It's like technical, yes, this is great. But without trust and communication, no, we get nowhere. So it's a... Uh, yeah, though that's a great that's a great answer, and I'm I'm curious actually too. This um, when the market is struggling, though, I mean there there's always opportunity. Does it actually um, give a bigger platform to a company that does have a good product and that does have something truly valuable to offer the industry? Does it some Does it also cut out the noise? From because if you have the market's good and everybody's buying everything and investing in anything, um, sometimes you can it's it's a little harder to make yourself known. Is there a little bit more of a platform for you now because the industry the, the industry is quiet and you can actually uh, bring a good product because it does add so much value. Is that the case, or would I be a little bit off in that? completely true i you know i hadn't really thought about that until you just brought it up now it, it, it's what we do see is that of the 500 projects that maybe companies were looking at through their technology development departments almost all of them are gone and mm -hmm. um what what's great for us is we are still here we're now being invited more talking more it has created this platform for us and I think the, the cream of the, the technologies, you, should, you can't say the cream of the companies yet because the technology is emerging. We don't know what the final view of the company will be. But right, right. now, people are listening because they're, they're, they're very concerned with costs, with pollution, greenhouse, all of that. And we're right there. And they've seen it work now. And that's a big step for us was the sponsorship to actually go do it because you know, I, I know that one of the clients, it, it cost them half a million dollars just for us to show up. They had to <laughs> and pull things out of the hole. And, you know, it's not a simple thing where it says, oh, sure, we'll try it. Whenever they right. say it's a million dollars, it's just disappeared. So it, it's, it's a big commitment, but we're getting the interest now, more so than before, now that we've actually done it. Well, it kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yes, but yeah, better platform now, that's for sure. Yeah, well... You know, and I think we're seeing, it in, I mean, even in our business, we, you know, you're, you're sitting where you are and we're sitting in our, in our studio as opposed to you having to, I mean, there's uh, the, this limited travel and sort of locking people into these areas, which is unfortunate in some ways, well, in most ways. Um, it, it's also streamlined people's, the way that they looked at how to communicate with each other and how to move projects forward. It, you know, it, it forces you to innovate. Um, and if you're, if you have that approach, uh, going back to me mentioning, you know, having a good attitude, if you look, you go, okay, well, I've got a set of challenges. Now there's, there must be a set of opportunities hidden under there somewhere. You create things like what you've created. Um, and and when things do open back up, there is going to be all those opportunities that you've capitalized in on, and it, it makes a huge difference. I, I think that you know when we look at the the industry and we see that our future, we, we were thinking, you know, let's let's take a look at four or five tools to start with, and let's let's get a look at that. But when we've looked at the marketplace now in Europe, the United States, Middle East. There's a demand for maybe 200 tools out there. And it's, it's going to have to be a good world for us to do that because they're like a million bucks each, right? There, there's a lot of yeah. hard, not cheap. So when we, when we look at this and we think the market recovers, how will we be able to, to meet the demand? How will we find mm -hmm. that? Is it going to be money is always an issue, let alone whether good tech and good partners, you know, when. Right. Some days, even the partners ran out of money. And, you know, we're at that now where a lot of oil companies are just not going to make it. They're going to change. But what we are seeing is many of the, the, the potential clients 
are now saying, now we have to double down on the science. You know, we have to cut costs. We have to increase the amount of technical work we do so that we get a better result in the end. And that ends up costing us less. So as long as our cost benefit is, is, is positive, we should be doing quite well. Because I, I think that we're entering into this phase where um, part of the cost has to be the environmental considerations. And that, that's that, right. And, and, and they all are doing as much as they possibly can on that right now. And we are part of that go forward solution. We've seen that with the response we get from organizations, you know, the National Research Council, National Resources, Sustainability Canada, BC Water, Clean Tech Water, Alberta Energy Regulator, Texas Railroad Commission, all have got the same view that we need these kind of tools to monitor the environment, to optimize mm -hmm. the recovery of resources and to go forward with a clean industry as much as it can be as it changes over these next 30 years and we move to different types of, of fuels. There's always right. a need to make products out of plastic. Um, in fact, you know, some people have even suggested that forget the cars, forget the gasoline, that, that's going to go away to, to be, you know, hydrogen or electric. And I, yeah. I, I want a Tesla myself, you know, but, but the, the industrial requirement is actually going to out, 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 out demand even the car by then. You know, we're, the, the yes. growing 100 million, 200 million people a year. Each one of those is going to consume how much stuff and oil yep. makes stuff. Mining resources make these things. So they're not going away. We'll have to change how we extract them and what we do with them. And, you know, we have to look after the environment. I mean, I've got grandchildren. You know, I mean, it's we really have to do this. But these tools make that happen. And, and not just others, but others, you know, there's, there's lots of things and we're doing our bit that will help that industry stay viable and relevant in, you know, into the future. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. No, it's, and, and, you know, doing this, uh, since we started the energy show, I think this is our fifth or sixth episode now, um, outside of all the other uh, shows we do. Um, and it's just, it's been really eye opening to me in the energy sector specifically, how much innovation and good innovation, you know, there's, there's a lot of ideas out there, but it's, it's been a real eye opener to see how many people like yourself and Turkana are, they're, they're doing it. I mean, they're not just talking about it. They really are. They're create, they're collaborating with other companies. They're raising capital. They're putting out their test work. You know, they're doing their brownfield and their greenfield. It's, it's being done. And I, I just, I think a lot of people even just watching this show are going to realize how much is being accomplished on the environmental side coming out of the energy sector, especially in Alberta, which is, I mean, quite frankly, unfortunately, has got a bit of a, a bad rap over the last few years, uh, quite unfairly in many cases. Yeah, I mean, we're, I'm not, I'm not finger pointing, but the, the, the oil and gas business has many places in the world that produce oil under very nasty conditions. That's and right. Yeah. In Canada, we have a set of regulations in place which uh, pretty much ensures going forward uh, and building on the history of what we've been doing that go forward, we will have the cleanest oil in the world. There's just mm -hmm. no about it. We will need oil. That's just not a, that's just the way it is. The world. Hopefully one day we'll say that the Canadian oil is the cleanest and the, the, the most ethical and uh, the most environmentally. All of those things, we do it the best. So yeah. given that, let's support it. Let's get, keep going and let's, let's take this technology to the world. Absolutely. I, I, think, I think that's a perfect spot to wrap up the interview, Tim. Uh, you know, I appreciate you coming on the show. I, I, I have a feeling you'll be coming back because I think there's a... Uh, this is this is sort of the the start of what you're doing, um, and I think there's a lot more to to see from Turkana in the future. So I hope you'll consider coming back on the show at some point. Well, I look forward to it, and I, and I think as soon as we get the short range system going, we should talk again sometime. Absolutely, uh, people could go to Turkana.ca. Is that I'll bring that up on the website as well. Um, is that the best place? And then there's ways to contact you through your website and things like that. Is that, is that the best channel to use? Yeah, that's all correct. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks a lot, Tim. Uh, thank you to the audience for watching. I, I hope 
Now, I know a lot of people from the um, energy sector watch this show, but I, if you're watching and you're outside of the industry, you know, I, I hope you're, you're realizing how many people here, you know, you talked to, to Tim mentioning that he has grandchildren and how many people in this industry are trying so hard to make the industry better, cleaner, and move us into the future and not trying. I think that's the wrong word. They are doing it. And, and thank you so much for watching the show. I, we hope you subscribe and follow us and keep engaging. I'm going to sign off and Gaudi will tell you how you can support the show as well. Thank you for watching, everybody. We'll see you on the next episode of Crownsman Energy. Thank you for watching. Please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn. Also, if you would like to help support the production of the show, please head on over to crownsman.com forward slash donations, where you will find two options, the five buck monthly subscription option and the support heavy industry one time donation option. Again, that's crownsman.com forward slash donations. Thank you so much for your support and we will see you on the next episode.